welcome to Property Question Time. My name is Gemma Forte and it's lovely to have your company. Let me introduce you to my trio of industry experts who are going to ask your property related questions today. First up we have Paul Mahoney who is the MD of the Nova Financial Group. Hello. Then we have Mary Ann Bowering, the founding director of the Ringley Group and Stefano Lucatello, Senior Partner of Cobalt Law International Property Lawyers. Right, welcome everybody. I like to just crack straight on, if I may, with our viewers' questions. So Paul, this one's for you first. Uh, my wife and I are in our 20s and we're looking to buy our first home in the next six months or so. We both work full time with salaried jobs and a combined income of a little over 50000 per year. We also have really good credit reports as a result of previous borrowing that is now pretty much all paid off. We currently rent privately and we will only have a 5% deposit by the end of our estimated six month period. With the new changes to stamp duty, etc., we've done an AIP just to see where we're at, and it's come back saying they'd be prepared to lend us 251,000. I'm after some advice, as the way I see it, we could use help to buy to go for a slightly bigger house or buy a smaller one on a normal mortgage. Okay. It's tough these days, isn't it? Just to get a <laughs> deposit, it really is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a big people problem. People work very hard, so and far then, as people you know, being able to save, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, the five percent, that five you know, percentage of some, of nothing is nothing. So it's hard for me to say what that actually is. But yeah. let's say we assume it's of the two fifty one. Yeah. Um, but that may not be because the two fifty one might be based upon their income. Okay. So there's two ways that lenders look how much they'll lend you. Yes. It's serviceability, which for a residential mortgage is how much you earn, mm -hmm. um, and loan to value, which is the five percent they're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, so if we say it's two. 5% of 251, so I've got 12 and a half thousand pounds or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the help to buy option, depending on where they're buying, might be their only option. Okay. Um, your standard residential mortgage is 80, 85%. Yeah. So if we're looking at 12 and a half grand, um, unless they're yeah. buying somewhere that's pretty cheap, mm -hmm. it's comparative to the rest of the country, yeah. um, that may not be an option. Um, obviously, that's the purpose of help to buy is to help people like like this couple that um, are struggling to get that deposit mm. to actually get into the market, um, and obviously that that would get them to that two fifty one mark. Um, but it does just depend on where they are in the country, I suppose, as to what their options are, sure. because that generally will determine the the, the prices of, of properties. Um, as to what they should do if they did have the two options, yeah. You know, it, it comes down to to their personal situation, I suppose. They're still borrowing the money with help to buy. So it still has to be repaid at some point. Yeah. Um, what is the difference? Well, it, the help to buy generally relies upon the idea that the property will be worth more at some point in the future. So it kind of makes up for right. that extra value. But it may not be. Right, okay. Um, so there, there is. So it's quite of, hard to get that type of mortgage. It must. It's uh, not quite hard to get it if you yeah. fit the criteria. Okay. Or if the property fits the criteria. If the pro property, so it needs yeah. to be a new build generally. Right. Um, so so you know often new builds will be a bit more expensive than older properties because they're new and they you know offer all the bells and whistles. But um, yeah, again, it, it's fairly limited information to provide a, a full sort of level yeah, of guidance as to what the, the, the pros and the cons are there. But sure. um, definitely get advice on those two different mm. types of mortgages and how that suits them and that suits some of their plans. Um, but because they're buying this place to live, it's a very personal decision. Um, so generally, people aren't willing to move you know, too far away from where they're comfortable just so they can buy. They've completely got their life so, in a So you know, that, that's going to have yeah. a big impact on things as well. There's the financial yeah. side of it and there's the personal side of it. Mm. Both need to be considered. It's just so frustrating for people that once they've got a mortgage sorted out, their monthly payments are so much less than the yeah. rent. It's just that rather big hurdle to get over initially, isn't there? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that's helped <clears throat> and good luck with it all. Um, okay, so Marianne, uh, this person says, I've recently purchased a Victorian terrace in Manchester, which is leasehold. I believe the lease to be 999 years from 1961, and the annual charge is only £5. We bought the property with the knowledge that the roof was damaged and would likely need a full re-roof. To make this more worthwhile, we plan to do a loft conversion with a dormer extension. 
and I know I need to obtain permission from the landlord to make any structural alterations. I did a bit of searching on forums and understand that many people don't bother when in similar circumstances. What would be the risk of going ahead without permission? I've emailed the solicitors who conveyance the purchase, but would appreciate any impartial advice to avoid them sending us down an unnecessary and potentially costly route. In short, the risk could be you losing your house. Um, because if the, risk, yeah. if the lease says that you need landlord's consent to make alterations, yeah. and if you don't have landlord's consent, you'll be in breach of a covenant of the lease. But then they could, what, take your house? If you're in breach of a covenant of the lease, that could be grounds for the landlord seeking or starting to commence forfeiture proceedings. Um, not necessarily scary. saying that the forfeiture would go all the way through, yeah. because there are some remedies and you yeah. could... You could undo what you've done. But get the, the, the wrong landlord who's particularly aggrieved and you're in serious well, it's trouble. Not, it's not the wrong landlord. At the end of the day, it's his freehold of his property. Yeah. Um, assuming that we all live 999 years, yeah, um, I um, <laughs> then he would get that house back at the end of that period. Mm -hmm. um, so he has an interest in that property. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but to get the landlord's consent anyway, the landlord would want other things. Mm -hmm. He would want you to have planning permission. You're, you're, you, know, you don't only need to be scared of the landlord, the local council could come along and say, we didn't give you planning permission for that. You've got to take it down. Take it down. Yeah. Um, so you've got the landlord who could forfeit for breach of lease, you've got the council who could um, prosecute you for not having planning, and then of course you may or may not have complied with building regulations as well, so we've built it under the building codes of this country mm. with the correct timbers of the correct size, correct load bearing capacity. Yeah. So there are some boxes that you need to tick, yeah. And ultimately, because you have a lease, in that lease there should be a lease plan. So your lease plan today has got a, a small house. Um, and you want to sell it, the first thing the solicitor is going to say is, is this house as per the lease plan? Yeah. If the answer is no, then you're going to have a problem with any future sale because the solicitor is going to know that there's things that haven't been yeah. done correctly. And the thing is, who's not going to give permission? It's like you can have a leaky old roof, you can have a nice new loft extension. If they're bearing the cost, surely you'd be like... Great, go for it, wouldn't you? There is a solution, though. You can have indemnity insurance. You could take out indemnity insurance, which would cover you for the amount of loss, pecuniary loss, that you might stand if the house were to be taken away from you. Oh. If the, so you could take indemnity insurance. Right, well, so do it without permission, but take well, that. If there's ever a potential for breaching a covenant, or if ever, for example, the usual one yeah. is there's only one house to be built on a plot of land. So you knock your house down, but you decide to build two houses on your plot of land. You would clear breach of the provisions there. Mm -hmm. But you take out indemnity insurance just in case someone down the chain of the, uh, the previous owners or the original owner's uh, family comes back and says, I know that you've breached the covenant. I want a, a penalty for that to be paid. So right. your indemnity insurance would actually mature and it would cover you. I see. Okay. But yes, I mean, the, the standard advice is always going to be get permission. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is the cost of the indemnity advice is probably the same as the cost of the paperwork for the landlord to give you consent. Yeah, yeah. So and actually, what interests me is, you know, I've done some searching on some forums. It's interesting that there's people on these forums saying, oh, yeah, I just... I just did it. Well, if it was your freehold house, then you've only got one risk, which is the planners. And if the planners have got um, other loft conversions all up and down the same terrace, then, of course, your risk is relatively small because you could go for retrospective planning permission or establish use consent afterwards. So you could hedge that risk by looking at the terrace and everybody's got a roof extension except for me. Right. But the risk of breach of covenant is a, another more yeah. serious risk and it is your home. Okay, just go the safe route. The just planners won't permission. take away your home, but your no. freeholder could. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks so much. Right, your question now, Stefano. So, this person says, my husband and I are UK residents and jointly own a property mortgage-free in Mar Menor. Do you know where that is? Yes, the Mar Menor. Yes, it's on the eastern seaboard of Spain. There you go. I have looked into releasing some equity in this property to put towards a purchase in the UK, but my mortgage advisor has advised us that because we're in our 40s, we're not eligible for taking a mortgage on the property as equity release is not permitted in Spain. We bought the house three years ago. So is it possible to take a UK mortgage out against a Spanish property after the purchase? Mm. Mm. Um. English banks and lenders do not like lending abroad. Mm. The only real chance she's got of a, an English mortgage being granted is if she goes to a foreign bank or a foreign lender which is based in the United Kingdom. Okay. So there are many of them and 
she should approach or they should approach that that the bank or those banks to see what they would do and what they wouldn't do. Mm. Um, it's better always to go to a lender in the country that you want that your property is based in. Okay. Uh, it is the case that equity release is not allowed in France, Spain, Italy, and Portugal. It's a concept that the English have created. Oh, really? Which has come from America. Uh, oh. And we follow suit with everything like that. So, but you can't because of equity release is not possible. There are there could be other ways of dealing with the matter, such as selling the property on a uh, long-term contract. You can actually sell your property, uh, derive some of the income now, and get it pay get the rest of it paid over a period of time, over a ten-year period. So, therefore, you have the right to stay. You'd negotiate the right to stay in your property and you would have part of the uh, capital sale value given to you now, mm. which might help you, uh, and the rest of it over a period of time. But otherwise, if they can't equity release, and I have to say if you're 40, um, in your uh, foreign banks seem to lend, or are happier to lend to a longer, uh, to a, a higher age group. So you can have in Spain, for example, a mortgage which will take you to your 75th birthday. Right, that's interesting, yes. yes. So you, I don't believe that they couldn't go to a Spanish broker and decide or arrange something else. There is there is a solution to the problem. Okay, excellent stuff. So again, it's just about consulting someone really good like Stefano and, and just getting the exact right advice. Thank you so much. Right, that's it for part one of Property Question Time. Join us after this short break. Welcome back to Property Question Time with me, Gemma Forte, and my industry experts who are answering your questions. Um, so, Paul, we've got one for you here. This person has written in saying, I'm looking at my options for moving house to be in the catchment area of a specific secondary school. I own my home, I'm mortgage free, and then I have another buy to let property with a large mortgage on it. I'm considering selling the buy to let and taking out a new buy-to-let mortgage on my present home to pay for the new home. As much as I'm aware, if I was to sell my home and buy a new one, or even rent a home for a year or two and then buy a new home, I wouldn't be liable for the additional 3% SDLT. But I can't work out if I'd be liable for it if I were to sell my existing buy-to-let, but keep ownership of my home and turn it into a buy-to-let. Any advice? My mind feels quite fried. I'm trying to sort of keep up with all of that. I think I've got that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it, it's not specifically my area of expertise, but I, I, I do understand the rules around, and we, yeah. we kind of do advise on it in, in a way. Um, my understanding is that the what they're asking to do, keep sell the home, keep the buy to let, buy a new home, mm. is they would be liable for it on the new home. Okay. Because it's not specifically buy to let properties. Mm -hmm. It's second and so forth property purchases. Got you. So even if you don't own a property and you buy a buy to let, you're not liable for it on that first purchase. Yeah. But you are liable for it on any subsequent purchases. Yeah. So unless they sold both, they would be liable for it right. on that subsequent purchase. Right. Okay, yeah. So basically, in any case where you've got more than yeah. one gaff, yeah. you're going to pay, yeah. It's an easy mistake to make because yes. it, it, it is referred to as you know, affecting buy to let. But yes. in fact, it affects any purchase more than one property. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting, isn't it, the sort of moving house and the catchment area situation. That's something that um, is just huge, specifically in the UK, or at least I know it is in, in, in London, and it actually changes the house prices, doesn't it? Yep, and there's actually a little trick around, does it apply to them? Perhaps. Um, if somebody is upgrading, so mm -hmm. let's say they currently live in a £100,000 property, yeah, and they're planning to buy a £500,000 property, mm -hmm. but they want to keep the £100,000 one. Right. Um, in that scenario, they would be liable for the extra 3% on the £500,000 property, which is a lot more yes, than 3% on 100 grand. Mm -hmm. So one way around that would be to sell the initial home to a limited company, which is a separate entity. Okay. Now you would pay the 3% on the 100 grand, 
because there's no there's no first concession for a limited company, um, but you wouldn't pay it on the five hundred grand property. Oh, okay. So they'd save themselves quite a lot of money there. They'd put mm. them that the buy to let into a limited company structure, which for some people would be a good way of structuring it anyway, and they'd avoid paying tax on the higher value property. Oh, there you go. So there are little so tricks. Maybe that would work for them if they were willing to move, sell their home, move their buy to let into the limited company, mm. and then buy the new home. Interesting. Something there you go. At. Yeah, that's definitely probably worth um, examining in full. Thank you. That's great. Okay, Marianne, uh, this person says, we've had an offer accepted on a flat. It's the top two floors of a three-storey Edwardian conversion. The mortgage advisor and one surveyor said that we can only get a home buyer's survey because it's a flat. However, other surveyors have said because it's an older property, you need to get a full building survey. So what do you think? First of all, I think you're the, you're the customer. Yeah. So providing it's your money, uh, you can get any survey that you want. Right, yeah, um, yeah. What is true is that the RSCS and which magazine together designs a home buyer's survey to be suitable for flats to go into more detail than a mortgage valuation would, mm -hmm. but it isn't a building survey and it isn't carried out necessarily by a building surveyor. Mm -hmm. um, so a building survey um, is a structured, detailed examination of the components of the parts of the building, mm -hmm. um, and you can set the brief and agree it with the surveyor, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately it will go deeper. The challenges with the building survey is there'll be parts of the property or parts of the wider context of the property that they might not be able to inspect. For example, they might, be able to, might not be able to inspect the drains because they're in the rear garden, which is demise yeah, to somebody yeah, else. Yeah. They might not be able to expect, inspect the roof because it's above a top floor flat and doesn't belong to you. Okay. So it's about limiting the scope. So yeah, the, the full extent of a building survey is unlikely to be possible on a flat, mm. but the parts of building survey detailed of your flat itself, plus contextual advice on risks in other parts of the area the property sits in, are still available. So if you were um, in, a, in a, say, a converted house or something, and would you be able to like knock on your neighbour's doors and say, look, I'm having a, a survey, would you mind if he came into your garden and had a look at the back or whatever? Does that ever happen? Or It does happen. Just on goodwill, I mean, you know. By agreement, two yeah. people can do anything they'd like to do. Yeah, not break into their flats, but, you know, <laughs> ask some permission. No, I mean, yes, of course it's wise, because yeah. in a flat you're, you pay for the upkeep of the building through a service charge. Yeah. So whether you're in the top floor flat, you're going to be paying for the roof and the drain. Mm. Um, and so those problems need to be quantified by you. Yeah. The way that often they're quantified instead is by asking questions of the person who's managing the whole building, right. such as when was the roof last done, are there any guarantees, when's it likely to be done, yeah. what money is in the reserve fund towards the roof, mm. so you can begin to get a, a feeling of the condition of it. Yeah. There may also be some questions your lawyer can ask about has... Um, a capital expenditure plan been put in place for the building? Is there a schedule of condition to say what needs to be done? Um, and it, likewise, the same on drains. Has there been any um, issues with tree roots in the drains? Um, you know, are the drains, yeah. when were they last cleared out? And for damp, of course, the damp is likely to only be in the ground floor flat. Yeah. But you can live in the top floor flat and have to pay twenty, thirty thousand pounds to make good the ground floor flat. So, Gosh. Um, often that in seems flats. Seems so unfair, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, yes, but then they're paying towards your roof. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. I mean, you, you live together in a flat, you yeah. pay together in a flat. So mm -hmm. it's about the depth and the intelligence of the question asking when you buy a flat. Um, a building surveyor will certainly help you frame all the right questions really well, mm. but what they're going to be concerned about is limiting their personal liability to you um, on areas of the property they weren't able to get into and inspect. Yeah. So it's a modified building survey, but survey, but depending on the age of the property, okay. they have the best skill set, and you are the customer, and you get what you ask for and what you pay for. Yeah, I always think knowledge is power. It's like the most expensive thing you ever buy, isn't it? Your property. So mm -hmm. I personally like to sort of get a building survey, and then what happens is they send it, and I think great, and I can't understand any of it. So then I just speak to them and go, "Was it all all right?" And they say, "Yes." And I think, great, fab. But at least you've got it and they've looked at everything. One thing you could do as lawyers, we always look at, we always ask preliminary inquiries and additional inquiries 
and uh, additional inquiries which are pertinent to the particular property that you're buying. Right. Uh, and also, if you can, ask your solicitor to look through his previous conveyancing documentation that he may have got from a previous solicitor or the previous owner, yeah. uh, and then you can actually tell, you can actually look through the chronological history and see if there have been things that have affected the building, and you can ask questions related to from those from those answers that you've had from previous sales and purchases of that pro, of that building. Got you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And and that brings me on to your question. Actually, we recently bought a villa requiring updating for cash. We've had some unexpected problems though, and we've got little money left of our budget, and are now considering a small mortgage or personal loan to complete. We'd be carrying out the work ourselves to keep costs down. Due to my age, 65, I'm aware I could only take a mortgage uh, for a maximum of 10 years. Um, lending 5% of the estimated value of the property when completed would be more than 50% of the purchase price. Can you recommend a way forward? I'm presuming that this gentleman mm. and lady have bought either in Italy or in Spain. Spain. Because he uses the word villa. Uh, let's say it's Spain. Um, you can borrow in Spain and in Italy for up to an age of up to 75. So he could borrow according to his financial criteria for yeah. 10 years. Yeah. If he borrows and he secures on his property, he will, pay, he will pay a lesser interest rate than if he takes out a personal loan. Right. Uh, that's the first thing. Yeah. Secondly, uh, it is the way to go forward. I don't really know what else I can add to the I think it's, Yeah, I think it's like reassurance and it's that sort of small mortgage versus a personal loan. If his wife, for example, is younger, his partner is younger and she's on the title deed, it may very well be that they could take out a mortgage in her name solely with him as a guarantor um, because she's a part owner of the property and if she's younger the mortgage could be for a longer period of time. What does happen, just God forbid, if somebody dies before the mortgage? is paid back? Um, abroad, mm. if you die, then the survivor is jointly and severally liable for the loan. For the loan, yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Right, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching and thank you, of course, to my three experts, Paul Mahoney, Marianne Bowering and Stefano Lucatello. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. And if you've got any questions, of course, get them into us because we love receiving them. The uh, website is www.property-tv.co.uk and uh, you can email us to info at property-tv.co.uk. See you soon.